Today is the 25th of April, uh, 2021. This last April, I was actually called in, and in in uh, I was in prison a year ago today. So, of course, I was called in by my case manager, and I was told that, hey, I'm eligible to go home. No, let me take that back. Uh, when the CARES Act came out, they put in, when everybody got their $1,200 uh, first stimulus check, they put in a provision for federal prisoners to be released to home confinement. At first, they, would, they brought this new system in, your pattern score, if you had a low pattern score, minimum pattern score, you get extra good time credits, extra. But I had a 2032 release date, so I wouldn't even worry about it. But when, it, when Bill Barr put, Attorney General Bill Barr puts out the memo that you can be released, then it perked my ears up. So a little back and forth with the case manager. Our case manager was actually scoring everybody wrong. He was actually scoring everybody with a drug case. If you had a drug case, he was treating that as violent. So, and he's a new, and all, all, there's no knock on the BOP. He was a, he was a formerly a corrections officer. He just became a case manager. So he's literally fresh from locking doors to now he's handling people's halfway house. Anyway, I explained to him, I had to, I had to, I had to bring him up to speed that, hey, drug cases are not violent. There's only kind of two particular cases where drug cases are violent. That's when you have bodily injury and that's when you have death. So say, for instance, you're selling drugs and people owe you money and you're beating them up, you're, you're, you're shooting them or whatever. They would consider that violent. Or say, for instance, you sell somebody some prescription pills or fentanyl, heroin, lace fentanyl, and they die. If you got death or serious bodily injury, that's violent. But just a simple drug case, not violent. Long story short, my case manager changes my pattern score. Now I'm a minimum. So... That still didn't end the dilemma. They didn't really understand. You know, one thing about us, uh, people in prison that we know more, we know like most prisoners, we probably know more law, more law than lawyers. We know more policy than people who work at the prison. So that's our job. We have to know policy. We have to know law. If because that's what it, it literally affects your life. So long story short, he they end up agreeing with me. Hey, you're right. I just couldn't believe they won't let me go home with 12 years left. Yeah. I could never wrap my head around that. So April 25th, they said, come on in. They sat me down. It was a 30-minute process. Where are you going to live? What's your address? Do you have somewhere you can stay? Uh, does anyone have COVID? Did anyone, oh, you know, they gave you like, it was like a 30-minute interview. So when we got done, he asked for a May 25th date. Of course, I didn't get out May 25th, and we'll get into all that later on. But yeah, that, a year ago today was when I finally got the okay that, hey, I can go home. So you had, um, remember this week I said, do you have anything fun or different coming up? And you're like, nope, it's my normal day. But today you had something different. Oh man, today I had brunch for the first time. Uh, I saw uh, my sister, my, if you see my, if you go to my Facebook page, you'll see brunch. Uh, my sister's friend is a, a excellent cook. So I actually, I saw some of their, their, their posts about how she could cook. So we got together to do brunch. And the funny thing about brunch is federal prison used to have brunch. <laughs> Different you know, for, brunch. Well, for all us old school guys, you know, they went in in the early 2000s. It's different. Now it's, it's nothing like it is. But it was nothing like I had today. So I'm still doing, still serving my sentence. And I still got to reminisce about brunch a little bit. So did you have, yeah. any, did anything pass your mind like? I could be in like, you know, it's still, is it, is it still surprising that you're out like having brunch with your family and a home and your friends? Like, is it still surprising? Does it still hit you? Like, wait a minute. I was just in this other situation six months ago. No, I'm past all that. I mean, oh, you I mean are? it's not really it, what, 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 I, what, what keeps me mind that keeps me grounded is that when it's a potential bad day or when it's a potential something that I don't agree with, I can always reflect back, hey, wait a minute. You ain't supposed to be here. So I'm not supposed to have no bad days yeah. because I'm not even supposed to be here. So I got my job, right? So, and they're paying me like $13 an hour, but it's really like a $17, $18 an hour job, but they're paying me through a temp agency. So, you know, I got to work three months, but I'm out the house, I'm moving around. But at first I was like, man, $13, wait a minute. This is taking away from my time to do my t-shirts. But then I had to reflect like, wait a minute. You were making 12 cents an hour in prison. Yeah. So it's just little stuff like that that keeps me, 
you know, it just keeps me rooted and grounded. So, so now nah, as far as it not being here, I have those little moments because I got I got friends out there. I still got good men that I left behind that should be home as well. So just thinking about them, you know, I I kind of have those moments, but as far as just the shock or nothing like that, no, nah, that, that it, it's not like that. So part of what this freedom exchange is that we I want part of my heart behind um, creating this was to teach people that have not been incarcerated like myself the terminology and getting a you know the lay of the land because there's things that I'm learning too. Um, home confinement isn't what I thought it was. The barriers and the, all of the the rules and could you give us like just spend a couple minutes kind of explaining truly what home confinement is. It's not like you're just home and you can do whatever you want. There's lots of things about it. Oh, you, I'm, I'm literally serving my prison sentence at home. Uh, for instance, I can't really leave unless I have a scheduled appointment. I have to be, like I can leave if I want to, but if I just leave without permission, I might as well just drive myself back to Beaumont. If I just leave, <laughs> I might as well just drive myself back to prison. So, uh, uh, it's home confinement, you know. I'm literally served. That's why I have life in the feds. A lot of people they didn't understand what life. In, yeah, we got life in the feds. We represent. A lot of people didn't know. Like, why are you out? I say, listen, I'm out, but I'm not out. You're not understanding. I'm actually at home, literally serving my federal prison sentence. I'm just feeding myself, and I'm just, you know, providing. But they, now they do take care of my medical if I have an issue. But the bad, it, it's like BOP medical also. I had a I had a rash or something. I don't know some detergent or something. I had a rash, so they have to put it into the BOP to get approved. It takes like two weeks, Allison. So listen, who has a rash for two weeks? So they say, well, hey, listen, you can go to the emergency, mine emergency, and we'll just reimburse you. So I called the mine emergency. You know, I don't know. I've been gone since two thousand two. You know, I don't know. It's a hundred and ninety dollars. You think I'm gonna let the government owe me a hundred and ninety dollars? Think I'm gonna trust them to give me my money back? So. I went and got me some uh, Benadryl and it was gone in a couple of days, so. So Kendrick, I have an acquaintance in my life that is on home confinement that it's more stressful for her. And there's been moments where she has said it, it's easier. It's crossed her mind that prison is less stressful than her home confinement situation for things like having to drive hours away to um, do a UA or checking in or worried that if you go a little bit off to the side, then you're off the, you know, the path that you said you were going to do that day. And just a lot of stress. Do you think that that's personality perspective? Do you think that some, um, is it your parole officer could be like harder or more particular than other ones? Like how, why do you think it's harder for some than others to do the home confinement routine? It's just, it's typical, typical government. Typical government, just typical, this government, that is what the government does. Each situation is different. Even in prison, each prison was different. You may have this prison giving you a year halfway house, well, this prison only given six months. You may have this, it's, it's just typical. Uh, I, I actually, when I released, I released from the, the Dallas, Texas area. I released to the Dallas, Texas area. So I had to be there because my, my case is out of the Northern District of Texas. I actually transferred here to the Western District in Austin. So when I was in Dallas, they called like five times a day. They called at two o'clock in the morning. They would just say literally, hey, this is your random. Is this Kendrick? And hang up. At two o'clock in the morning, they wake you up at two o'clock in the morning. I mean, you could answer the phone, Alice. You could have said, hey, hello. And they didn't even, anybody could answer the phone. It was it's just crazy. But when I get here, the first thing I asked my case manager, hey, yeah, he said, no, we're not going to be calling. You got the GPS. We know where you are. Right. Why would we call? Right. So here, they don't call. Here, it, it, it's more laid back. Here, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, one thing about the criminal justice system, one thing about uh, the system is you got enough, they got enough people that's not trying to do the right thing. They're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed with people that's trying to be slick, people that's trying to do this, do that. The ones that's doing the right thing, I'm really a waste of his time. Yeah. I'm really wasting his time because I'm I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. So he has for every one of me, he got 20 knuckleheads he got to chase down. So I understand. I've heard that. That's how it was where I just left. It was stressful. You had to get there. Like now, I, they call me in for a UA. They know that I'm working. I can wait till after I get off work to go. As long as I'm there, you know, before the day is out. 
Yeah, it sounds other like it's not be, that easy. Yeah, other places you got like two or three hours to be there, and you and it's like strict. Are they gonna write you up? So, I I, I know what she is, but listen, prison. No, I don't know. I don't know what she is, but this this can't be. Uh, uh no, sitting out in, my, in the backyard, prison can't be better than this. <laughs> if they want me, if they want me to just put a build a tent out here and just sleep out here, better. I would do that. Yeah. You know, if, if I could just, if I just build a tent. This would be my little area. You know, my my yeah. cell wasn't this big. Yeah. My, my cell wasn't big as this little deck. So yeah, I mean, I, I'd be fine. But it's it's about perspective. Yeah. I don't know how much time I don't know how much time your friend did, your associate did. I don't know where she did her time at, but you know where I did my time and the much time as I did. I would sleep in this grass out here. I, you know, I would just be out here in the backyard. I go on the bridge. I would sleep on the bridge right now. So yeah. Well, I'm really grateful you're where you are. It's beautiful where you are. Um, so just to touch a little bit more on the, you said it's typical government. So do you want to talk a little bit about your your sentencing? And we've had a guest on already that had the hundred times rule apply to them. And I know you had that scenario in your sentencing, but it didn't really make sense. Like that's a lot of the government thing in the criminal legal system. It's like so much doesn't make sense. So much is not consistent. You could have done the same thing as the next person, but got really different sentencing. You want to talk about that a little bit with your story? Yeah, I'm on, I'm on a lot of platforms and, you know, I, I, I hate to give disclaimers, but I hope I don't make people mad. I don't mean to be political, but whatever political party you're with, you know, I, I would encourage you to uh, listen to what they say and pay attention. Uh, I'm under the 100 to 1 crack powder ratio. Uh, they, they, back when I got sentenced, they, tra- they, t- they treated crack 100 times worse than powder. And those are those Democrats and Republicans, you know, who in the 1990s, Joe Biden, our president, who actually orchestrated the bill. So they reduced it under the Obama administration. They, adu- they reduced it to 18 to 1. So here you are, you have people talking out of both sides of their mouth. You, they, they throw around this term systematic racism. You know, one party throws around this, this term systematic racism, but yet you have a law on the books that treats crack 18 times worse than powder. You have the House, you have the Senate, you have the presidency. So but hold on. Every, when, when I hear certain politicians use that term, I kind of cringe because Stop lying to the people. But anyway, you know, uh, hey, I, that's what it is. What it is, you know. I tell people, listen, if you're not in the picture, you can't be framed. So I'm not a victim. You know, I was breaking the law. Did I deserve 400 months? Did I deserve 33 years more time than Manuel Noriega, who was supplying countries? Did I deserve? I wasn't even alive 30. I was only 29 years old when I got arrested. I hadn't even been alive 33 years. So. You know, I, I remember the first time you told me about the Manuel Noriega story. Of, you know, he was he was the dictator in Panama. Is that what he was? And he was supplying drugs to a whole country, and he got extradited to like France and to other countries for all of his charges. And you got more time than him. I got more time than him. Yeah, I got I more mean, time. So that just makes no sense. How did you wrap your brain around like emotionally? How did you? get through that when you got sentenced and you first entered prison like how did you that would just be so infuriating like what was your perspective on that well now that was now now, like the question you asked me earlier you know you you wonder how you how'd you get here now that's how it was uh when i first went in the system because i was i was on what's called the rocket docket i got arrested in may may 2003 I went to trial in August, 2003. I was sentenced in October, 2003. In December, 2003, I hit the federal, I was in, in federal custody. So just imagine, May to December, I'm in federal custody. I'm watching the Super Bowl in Oakdale, Louisiana. I'm watching the all I'm watching all these events. So, and this was like, let's see, when September 11th hit, that was September 11th. So that year, the Pro Bowl and the All-Star game was like the same weekend. In February 2002, I was in Hawaii. I was in Hawaii at the Pro Bowl. So fast forward 18 months later, I'm looking at the Pro Bowl and I'm in federal prison. I'm like, wait a minute, man, huh? Man. Wait a minute, I, I was just at this event. How am I in prison with all this time? 
and then dealing with the with, with, with the case and how things went down and, 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 and with the with the witnesses against me. So everything was like kind of, it was moving fast. So it took me about like, you know, it, it, it bothered me. It bothered me for the first two or three years. But after a while, you know, uh, I'm a strong minded person. I'm a strong willed person. After a while, you just roll with the punches. You know, I mean, you just, I, I rely on my faith as a believer in Jesus Christ. I know that, you know, I, I just grew in my faith. And one thing about when I was in prison, okay, now you now you're in time out. You know, I like to call it my wilderness experience. So now you're in the wilderness. So I like, I tell the wilderness story about Moses. Moses was in Egypt 40 years. In Egypt in the Bible, that's a type of sin. So when you're in a type of sin for 40 years, God put him on the wilderness to, to get the, get to give, to, to get that out of him. So it, it, it's just a, you know, it, it was all in God's time and Allison. I personally didn't think it took 17 years to have my mind, my thought process change, but God knew different. Here I am today. I'm better for it. I'm able to encourage people and help people. And, you know, you know, looking back, you know, uh, the Bible talks about better is the end of a thing than the beginning. I I didn't understand that in 2003. In 2003, I'm like, man, I don't know how no good going to come out of this. This, this, no, this is, this is not good, but you know, it's, it's working out. It's working out. Well, talk to us about how it's working out. Talk to us about what you're doing to fill your days in Texas. Well, listen, I'm working now. I got me a job. I work for a wholesale windshield distributor. So uh, they let me, uh, I guess if you get a rock chip and you get anything done with your windshield, you go to the company. But this, I work for the place that supplies those windshields. So they gave me a route. I got two routes. I go to South Austin. Uh, I got a 930 route and a 12 o'clock route. So I'm just driving. I got my little sheets, I got my little address, I put it in my Google, my GPS, and it takes me each stop, I unload the windshields, I pick up windshields, I go back. So, you know, I'm just out seeing different little stuff. I stop at uh, HEB, that's a grocery store down here in Texas. I stop at Subway. And the good thing about it, the halfway house gave me permission to work there. I can go as far as Waco, Texas. That's like a hundred miles down the road. So, uh, so, I mean, now I'm out, so I can go to I can go to get a pizza. I can go, you know, on my on my route. So it's kind of like a little freedom. Are you listening to anything, or do you have recurring thoughts in your head as you're just doing your little route and driving around Texas? Like, is there something that you're always just thinking, or do you like podcasts? Are you, what do you how are you feeding yourself? I listen. To, I listen to different podcasts. One of, one of my uh, the way the way I did my uh. My prison sentence, I listen to a lot of Christian radio. So I listen to American Family Radio. I have the app. So I remember, doing, especially during coronavirus, we couldn't go nowhere. So I, we had MP3 players in federal prison. So I would just put it on MP3. Uh, uh, uh. So yeah, that's why I'm, I'm listening to a little radio, a little music. I just, you know, it's whatever, really. I get to the news, you know, okay. especially with, with, with the iPhone. So. So one of my favorite things about getting to know you over this time that we've, all the times we've talked is I'll ask you this question and then we'll work into this thing. But what kind of little kid were you? Oh man, I was Probably a, like you at like 10 years old. At 10 years old, I was, I was a typical little kid, typical, uh, you know, in trouble. Uh, uh, I'm the youngest of four. So I was a little bit of a tattletale. My sisters would tell you, uh, my, 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 my dad was like, Hey, where's your sister them at? Tell me to come in the house. You know, I'm young. I didn't know. I was like, they down there kissing those boys. They down there kissing that boy. I told her to come on. So yeah, <laughs> we laugh, we laugh about that now, but, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I was always industrious. I remember going in the Safeway. Did y'all have Safeway? Yep, we have one North, down, Safeway? down the road. Well, listen, I remember going in the Safeway and I remember getting these bags of Jolly Ranchers, like for a dollar. And I used to be in school selling Jolly Ranchers like for a nickel a piece. And I still remember that I always had this, this entrepreneur type spirit, like this drive. I just used it as I got older for something illegal. And I was like, I used to sit in prison a minute a day, Allison, like, wow, man, how am I sitting up in here, man? I know other stuff to do. I'm not a dumb person. You know, I don't look too bad. I'm not too bad on the eyes. I'm not just the best looking person, but you know, 
I don't have, I don't know how am I sitting in prison, sir. Yeah, so did you use that industriousness in prison? Well, really in prison, my, my main thing was to get out. My main thing in prison was to uh solidify my my, my relationship with Jesus Christ and 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 to keep my family uh close. You know, I I got five kids. I'm a father of five, three girls, two boys. You only get 300 minutes a month. So I had to like schedule my time. Then the email came in. So I was just trying to with my kids, just try to you know without me. Of course, you know, young people are doing their lives. So all I could do was just call every so hey man, let them know your daddy loves them and this, that, and so so that's that's how I really uh in prison, not so much. I would do like, you know, guys would want me to do legal work, but I'm one of those blunt people. I'm I'm not I'm one of those upfront people. I'm gonna tell you what I mean. I'm gonna mean what I I'm say what I mean. So if you ask me to come help you work on your case, Allison, and say, hey, listen, this is what the law says. This is what we're gonna do. Now, I don't know if this is gonna work. But now you got some shysters in prison that say, yeah, you're gonna get out. Yeah, you're going home. Or are you gonna win? And they're trying to just get money from people. But I'm one of those people, listen, I don't wanna be look coming for me. So I'm gonna tell you the truth. And 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 hey, we're gonna wish for the best. So uh, I didn't really do too much legal work. I would help guys with administrative remedies. That's like say if you got a toothache, or say you got a health condition, and they don't want to treat you. I would help guys write that up. And, you know, if they want to give me something, it's cool. If they want to, you know, I ain't, yeah. you know, I, I was cool. But as far as just being industrious, just having a prison hustle, whatever you call it, nah. I do like to ask that question. That wasn't my thing. Sometimes, like, what if you had a prison hustle? I always find that fascinating. That the way people do that, but you have a, you have a out hustle. Can you, will you talk about all this awesome stuff? Tell us about what this is. How did it start? Oh, you know, one thing about the federal, now? man, this life in the fed started just me, just, I don't know. I was just, I was just messing around with it. I was on TikTok and I, I don't know. I just, it just came up to me. Look, man, it's life in the feds, life in the feds. Like, man, yeah. I guess that was my surreal moment when I was just sitting around at the house. You know, I was in I was in Dallas, Texas. My uncle has a pool table and a man cave. So I was like, man, I'm in a man cave. I'm watching, this is life in the feds. So I just came up with the moniker with the name and it just kind of just took off. I, I, I put some stuff on TikTok and I'm on Instagram. And so now, I'm, and, and really uh, my co-defendants, when I say co-defendant, that's the person that got, got arrested with me. He, I gave him a shirt and he did a post and he had a, he had an excellent saying. He said that if you've been to the feds or if you know someone in the feds, you're living life. If you're in the feds, know someone in the feds, then you're living life in the feds. And, and it's so true. You know, uh, my mother, my kids were doing time with me. You know, they, they were doing time. Uh, it, a lot of us, we don't be considered by actions. We do stuff without thinking who it affects. So, it's just it, the support has been tremendous, but most importantly, uh, uh, I was just thinking about it the other day. Most importantly is also it's about life through Jesus Christ. I'm a firm believer that if you're not living, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you're not living. And the only way I made it through 17 years of federal prison is by the help of Jesus Christ. That's all I made. So That's the freedom. it's just taking off. It's been tremendous. It's been a, a lot of support. Well, yeah. I. I want to come back to this, but I want to take a little left turn for a second and how you were saying that your family is living life in the feds with you when you're, when you're in. So this is a, let's take a moment to educate those that don't know what's going on with this home confinement situation. And when the pandemic is over, what you are possibly faced with, can you, can you share that with all of our viewers, this situation that's going on? Well, well, the way they wrote the, the CARES Act, the way they wrote the bill was once the emergency ends, there's a provision under the former, under the Trump Justice Department, the way they wrote it, Congress, whoever, whoever wrote it, there's a provision that says once the emergency ends, then we could possibly go back. Because the way the law is written, I watched the, the BOP director testify before Congress a couple weeks ago. And um, it, 
he's right. The the way the law is written, only so many if, if you you have to be two years or less short on your sentence. That's what the law says. So he's just saying that hey, we'd have to enforce the law. But since since we we've been bringing awareness, the public's been getting involved. Now they're they're backtracking. You know why would you do that to people that's already in society working, doing the right thing? So, but he was actually right. Had there been no pandemic, had there been no, I, I was not eligible for this. So he's saying, that, "Hey, Congress, y'all need to change the law. If you want me to change it, change. If not, he has a job to do. That's just part of his job. But they, it's so they, realistically, they don't see it happen. They don't have the staff. The it's already a backlog of people coming in the system." So the return, I think it's 4,000 of us that don't meet that criteria. So 4,000 at at least 40,000 ahead. So you, you know, that's, you, you know, one thing about it, they're, they're watching the dollars. So uh, that's the thing. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm hoping it doesn't happen. Uh, of course, if it happens, I wouldn't be surprised. That's the government. I'm a, you know, everything the government does is kind of backwards. So I cannot wrap my brain around all that you're doing, you just individually, plus anybody else that's out on this, from the CARES Act and all that you're doing, all the reconnections, the job, the, you're paying your own way eventually, you know, like I just can't wrap my brain around. It just feels cruel and unusual. Like it would make no sense that you're safe enough to be out and, you know, society is okay with Kendrick on the streets, yet you're going to have to go back. I mean, just the conversation itself makes me really, really mad. So. Thanks for explaining that. Um, okay, I want to get back to something. Hey, you fun. know what's funny? You know what's funny, Allison? Okay. What? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, well, where, where I work at, right? They, I I call. I was like, so what do I wear to work? He said, just wear some tenor, t He wore, do wear tennis shoes and a t and make sure you got some sleeves. So of course, I got my life in the feds hat. I got my life in the feds t-shirt. I got on my cargo shorts. And I got this ankle monitor. So I said, hey, listen, you're not going to be worried about this leg monitor, are you? He's like, no, why? I don't want to scare your customers. You may see this, 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 this federal beeper on my ankle. There's this garage door open. Or something. <laughs> when you say about being in society, people see about It's actually a conversation piece. So I get to talk to people about my situation. So it's actually good. So Good conversation. Good. Like, <laughs> you have an awesome perspective. I just, that's sort of life in general. It doesn't matter what hard thing we're going through. It's really our perspective and feeling like we have hope and we're going to be okay. And surrounding yourself with people that are going to love you and forgive you and see the best in you. And that's just, it doesn't matter what we're going through, but I appreciate your perspective on that. Um, so I told you today when we talked earlier that I think you probably have more social media and technology skills than I do. And when you went into prison, none of that existed. None of it existed. And now you have like a gazillion TikTok viewers or are they called followers? I don't do TikTok really, but uh, <laughs> you have so, I've watched your TikTok, followers, followers. crack me up, crack me up. You're just like living your best <laughs> life, loving what you're doing. People are interacting. You're so good at man, like, I need to manage viewer questions with you with, because Christy's having technical difficulties. Um, so she's not here to help right now, but I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to do this in a minute, but you are so good at <laughs> cooking your chicken and talking to the people and then and looking at questions. You're just so smooth about it. So where did all that come from and how did you learn from nothing to where you are right now? Well, like I said, I've always been industrious. I've always been one of those kids. I always been one of those people that if you get something, let's say if I get a box, I never read the instructions. Only time I read the instructions was when I couldn't figure it out, but I just get it and try to put it together. But uh, when I left, when I went to prison, I had the next, I had the next tail flip. I don't know, I don't know if you're old enough, Allison, but to remember that I had the next tail flip like phone. That was the church. Yeah. No. Yeah, we are. I don't I know. know. I thought you. We'll I thought you about. Later. I know. Yeah. Okay. I thought you were way, I thought you were 10 years younger than me. Anyway, uh, nope. I had the next tail flip, you know, with the chirp, you know, with the walkie talkie. And uh, I mean, I've always been, uh, you know, I don't know, but I got out of prison. My, my daughter, my son picked me up, who was 21. He was like three when I left. My daughter was like 18 months when I left. She's 19, they picked me up. They hand me this iPhone 11. So I'm working, I'm using it. So 
they got tired of me asking them, hey, how you do this? They they like, dad, look, you got to figure it out. So I just sat down with it. YouTube was my best friend. Siri is my friend. Hey, Siri, how do I? So I just I just work it. I mean, as far as the, I'm a people person. I mean, it's just, if they had social media before I went to prison, oh my God. If I had social media at 29, Good or bad. just being, just, uh, it'd be good because, you know, I, I was, um, before I got arrested, like I was in the uh, entertainment. I had a, a record company and I was doing concerts. I, I promoted concerts. So social media, everything would have been so easy, you know, yeah. but unfortunately, uh, but I don't know. I mean, everybody asked me that, like, how did you learn this? I don't even know how to use iPhone. I don't know how to, like, so I'm not I don't a, know. I, I'm not very original on my question. Okay, so um, <laughs> what um, what would your dream job be now that you, like, you get this whole new awesome social media technology gift to add to your life, and you're already using it, and I know that driving and doing windshield work is not your dream dream job, so what, if know. there were no barriers, if there was no um, garage door opener on your ankle, if you know, what would you do or what will you be doing when it's time? I definitely want to get back into real estate. Uh, but the real estate market is just so expensive down here. It's just, I don't know. I don't know how that would work. I guess I have to buy me some houses uh, and try to rent them out. But uh, I want to do, I want to do the Amazon box truck thing. But of course, the halfway house won't let me 1099. They won't let me do any 1099 work. Uh, I don't know, Allison, the sky is the limit. I mean, once this thing comes off, the sky is the limit. Uh, man, uh, I got I got family members who own car dealerships uh, that's in the auto business. Uh, it's really no limit. But my, my first thing, what I really want to do is ministry. I really want to do prison ministry. I want to be able to go back in and talk to the men and women in prison, you know, and help them. That, that's number one. That's, that's really what I want to do. I want to just go back in and encourage the people that, hey, man, listen, whatever sentence you got, whatever, how much time they gave you, all you can do is one day. And that freedom is only one kind of freedom, and that's in Christ Jesus. You know, I used to be in prison, Allison, and I would see guys going home, and I would be like, man, you know, he's going home. And I hear, like, a month too late, he got killed. He died. I was like, wow, he was in a car wreck or something happened. And I was like, man, it helped me just put things in perspective. Listen, you got a 2032 date, but look at that guy. Look at that person. They're dead. And then the Lord just showed me that, hey, man, people are leaving prison. It's people that's not even in prison that are locked up. They're in bondage to drugs. They're in bondage to alcohol. They're in bondage to debt. So just because you're, you you know, I was more free than, than I could be more free in prison. with four. I'm more free with 400 months with this leg monitor than most people that's making uh, uh, $500,000. You got rich people that commit suicide all the time. And you would think that they have everything together, but if you don't have Christ, you don't have it together. So my ideal thing would be definitely the ministry. And then whatever the Lord got for me. You know, one thing about it, I'm an industrious person. I'm a people person. If, if I got to go cut grass, if I can just cut grass or whatever and just tell my story and help somebody, that's what I want to do. Because one thing about money, I learned the hard way. Money is a lot of things, but it's not everything. Yeah. It's a lot of things. No matter how much money I had, Allison, I couldn't get out of prison. Yeah, and so, that's, you say that's what attracted you to using your industriousness in a way that got you in prison was, do you think it was the money, the lifestyle? What was it that kind of turned you left and headed that direction? It was more the lifestyle because once you have the money, it's like, why are you still doing it? So it's just a lifestyle. Yeah, It's just, you know, once you got the money, once you got this, once you got that, you really got... And I look back, man, I was thinking they would they were starting subways for like thirteen thousand dollars. And I'm like, man, you know, we would we spend eleven thousand on a shopping spree. We go shopping and spend eleven thousand dollars. So it's like, come on, man. You was when I think about it, like man, that was crazy. I could have had a subway. You know, you just blowing money, just wasting money. So well, and you, you know, said uh, you visited you visited friends in prison. You saw what they what they had lost and the way they were living and they were locked up and you were free to come and go and visit them. And it still didn't switch that in your mind. Like, I don't want to be there. No, my friend, I got a friend of mine. He got 210 months. He got 20, what's 21 years. He got 210 months in 1991. 
And I used to go visit him, you know, and it was like, it didn't even, you know, in your mind, oh, that's just him. He got caught because he did this. He got caught because he did that. So now, Allison, I, I'll be honest, you know, like I said, I'm not a victim. You know, I, I needed to go to prison. And one thing about God, certain things work differently. Had I got a 10-year sentence, Allison, that would have been like just a slap on the wrist for me. Because with a 10-year sentence, a first-time offender, I wouldn't have went to a higher custody prison. I wouldn't have saw the violence. I wouldn't have saw the stabbing. I wouldn't have saw the lockdown. So by me going to a, but getting a longer sentence, I had to go to a higher custody. So I experienced a lot of stuff. And if I got 10 years, I probably would have started out at low, went to a camp, been at the camp. You know, guys are still having kids at the camp. So wow. it's like, you know, it's, it's like, you know, so certain things I needed, I needed, I didn't need 17 years, but I needed it probably at least, it took me about a decade to get stuff out of my system. That's just me personally. One thing about it, you have to know yourself. I appreciate that honesty a lot because I don't, you know, we, a lot of us make mistakes and a lot of us fall really hard and we don't have to always go to prison for it. But if we can look at it with that perspective as like, I needed probably it to, I needed to fall this hard and have this much, um, whether it's, you know, shame or embarrassment or things being taken from us. So like I, I'm recently coming out of something like that and we can say, I wish that never happened. And I can't believe I ended up there, but I know I needed it to be where I am today. And I'm going to find gratitude and perspective. That's, you know, going to grow me. And I love that you say that not everybody we've talked to um, always has that perspective of like, I, I needed that time to shake me to the core where I needed to be shaken. And it's not everybody that has, it's different for everybody. So I think it's honest. I, I really respect when you say, um, just don't get in the game. Like, just don't, yeah. like, it's it's that simple. Really, don't get in the game, make different choices. And I think you, somewhere I had watched an interview with you and you said, even in prison, like you could have made a lot of choices in prison that would have changed your experience in there, but you made certain decisions intentionally to not make it harder on yourself. Right. You know, I was in prison. I was in prison for doing wrong. So I could either go further and further to doing wrong. So look, like, I'm I'm industrious person, Allison. Let's not get it twisted. I know. I am a very I am a very industrious person. So trust me, it was all kind of stuff I could have got into. And I I'm not I'm not a dummy. And I I, I could do stuff that'll run circles around people, you know, hence why I got 400 months in prison. You know, one thing about it. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is true or not. This is what I strongly believe, though. If you got a lot of influence, certain powers that be don't want certain people on the street that got a lot of influence. Yeah. If you can influence a lot of people, lead a lot of people, you're really like a threat. Yeah. So, but now I want to use it to influence and lead people the right way. So oh, I had a choice. No I doubt. had two roads. Yeah. I had two roads in prison. You got two roads. You need to go to the left or you can go right. So going left is what got me here. Going the wrong way is what got me in prison. So do I want to go further, further? So you know what I said? No, let me go on. Let me, no, I don't want. I don't want to talk about the lifestyle I used to live. I don't want to talk about the glory days because I'm serving a 400 month prison system. So, yeah. so I just tried. I just chose to go right. And good thing about it, it took 17 years, but doing what's right came back to help me because I could have stabbed people. I could have been in violence. I could have been all that. But if I would did that, guess what? You don't. You're not eligible for home confinement. If you have violence, if yeah. you, if, if if you have certain kind of uh, uh, incident reports, you're not eligible for this. So, the yeah. fact that I did well and chose to do right, I got reward in the end. Yeah. It just took 17 years. <laughs> Yikes! Um, something. One of the things I tell myself in my own personal self work every day is make a decision today that's going to make the future Allison be where she wants to be. And, right. and that's what you're talking about is any little decision I make isn't really that little because it all accumulates and gets me the, you know, where I want to go. And I've done things the other way and it's taken me places I don't want to go. So it's every decision you make when you're doing your job, when you're interacting with your family to get Kendrick where Kendrick wants to go. So you're doing that. Um, so I'm really sad I don't have my partner in crime, although she's in California having a rip roar and good vacation. So she's not here to kind of do this end part with me, but she usually does the speed round. And it's, um, I wanna ask you some questions that we've never talked about, but they're just 
give short little couple word answers, if that's okay. Okay. Um, okay. Here's my, this is one of my favorites. What was your favorite prison food? Oh, I'm, I'm a chicken man. So it's gotta be something with chicken. It's gotta be something with chicken. Is there good chicken in prison? Well, you know, the funny thing about chicken in prison, they serve leg quarters. And I kind of grew up eating leg quarters. You know, leg quarters are cheap. And my mother had twins. Our first kids were twins. So with four kids, my parents would eat the leg, would eat the wings and breast, and they would give us leg quarters. So I said, wait a minute, thighs and leg. I'm like, so when I got older, when I got grown, I made some money. That's all I ate was wings and breast. Well, when I got to prison, I was back to the, the leg quarter, so. Okay, yeah, so, got it. Yeah. Um, so, okay, are you a morning or a night person? Right now I'm all over, but morning. I was gonna say, I've talked yeah. to you all hours, like early yeah. and late, so I don't know what you are. Okay. Right now, oh, morning, my, my, my thoughts are the freshest in the early morning. I'm, four, I'm a four or five o'clock man, that's me, in okay. the morning. Describe yourself in three words, but don't use the word industrious. Don't use the word industrious. Uh, uh, describe myself. I'm blessed. I'm humble. And three words, man. Blessed, humble, and night. I don't know. Uh, uh, fun. I don't know. <laughs> you are fun. Everybody should watch your TikToks because you're fun on your TikToks. Um, what is a compliment yeah. that do people give you the most? Oh man, I get a lot of compliments. So I, I'm gonna go with my TikToker. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is from TikTok. Okay. Handsome. <laughs> nice. That's a, good, that's a good compliment. Um, let's see. I'm looking at Christy's list right now. The things that she likes to ask. Um, besides your family, who did you miss the most while you were in prison? Besides my family, besides my kids, besides my children, let me see. Man, nobody really, but besides my family, uh, I miss going to church. I miss being in the fellowship with the, with the, with the church, so, yeah. yeah. Can, you, can you go to church now? Yeah. No, no, I can't go to church. Uh, even though the BOP, even though the state, Texas is open, but the BOP is not, uh, they're not, I don't know, I'm working now, so. By me working, that's a great thing about where I'm at. By me working, I may be able to get a three or four hour pass that I go to the movies or go out to eat. I don't know. Uh, they normally do that if you work like at least 32 hours a week. So maybe, hey, maybe I can go to service. Oh, that'd be good. Um, okay. I'm, so if you're watching this, if you're live with us right now, this is a good opportunity for you to start sending questions in. And I'm on my phone with Christy because she, I'm asking her to send me the questions because I'm not as smooth as you are, Kendrick, where I can look at the questions and keep talking to you. Like I'm struggling with that. So um, she's going to work on that. But I want to ask you on a scale of one to 10, 10 being high, how cool are you? I'm probably about a 10. I'm, I'm pretty cool now. I'm, I'm probably about a 10. I mean, I can be. I'm, I'm pretty cool now. How about um, on a scale of one to 10, how shy are you? Uh, it's crazy. Yeah, uh, I can say I'm about a probably a six, seven. Okay, one to ten. I'm um, creative. Yeah, about a six or seven. I mean, I don't know. Depending on what it is, art, work, and all that. I'm not really too creative and all that. <laughs> all right, I'm with you there. Um, okay, I'm looking at my phone because she's getting questions. Um, who do you admire right now? Who are you watching in the you're admiring. For my wife, TV on social or what? On um, ask who my mind, what she means. Okay, say it one more time because you you pause for a minute. We're having pause issues. Let me see. Let me go back. Let me go back towards. Okay, wait, it's kind of, is it's that better? In. Yeah, it's coming back in. I'm outside. Who am I admiring as far as like on TV or what, or just what? People that are doing cool things. Mm -hmm. People that are doing awesome. Uh, 
Man, I, I hadn't really had a chance to really follow too many people. I don't watch much TV. Uh, man, I, I admire anyone anyone trying to... Uh, 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 man, that's a good question, man. Y'all... Uh, Man, I'm 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 kind of more routine oriented, so I listen to a lot of like a lot of preachers, a lot of pastors. So, anyone preaching the word, anyone bringing a good message, and it's not enough truth tellers out here. You have to tell people the truth. If you don't tell people the truth, you don't love them. So, anyone telling someone the truth, even when it hurts, oh, I love it. you got you have to tell people the truth. Yeah. Um. What is it? What makes you smile or makes you feel really happy that's something we haven't even touched on today that's not the obvious like tell us something new about you that we don't know what's something that makes you just brings joy and happiness to you man brings joy and happy just being able to wake up every day just being able to just share my story just being able to uh just encourage somebody if I, I see somebody having a bad day and i can you know once i tell them my story then they they get like oh okay yeah, yeah I don't yeah I don't <laughs> my little problems is nothing once 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 they hear my story once they hear what I'm going through then whatever they're dealing with they're like nah it don't even compare so that brings me joy just to be able to uplift people just to be able to encourage people that's what uh uh I'm a big believer that God blesses us to be a blessing to others so mm -hmm. that's just that's just what I like to do that's a great segue to my we're wrapping it up here pretty soon, but one of my, um, I want to give you the opportunity to shout out the people and the organizations that were encouraging to you while you were in there, or maybe that you're still, you're still involved with, or, you know, cause you do a lot of interviews. So talk, shout out those awesome organizations and people that are doing good work. Now I want to shout out the can do foundation, Amy Povo. I hadn't met Amy personally, but I met Malik. Uh, the people from FAM, Kevin Ring, uh, Debbie Campbell. Uh, man, it, it's just so many amazing groups. Uh, it's a lot of uh, paralegals that would send in case laws, send in cases, different things like that. Uh, just just anybody. Uh, man, I know Amy, uh, FAM. There's some others. Uh, and I can't even think. <laughs> that I've been in, I would. Yeah, FAM. FAM it's definitely. It's really FAM. great for me to learn like what following them on Facebook they post some really great content that's really teaching me a lot so I'm loving fam right now for sure fam had me speaking to congressional staffers actually we, we had like a two or three days of zoom meeting with congressional staffers on home confinement and on um making the 18 to 1 crack powder disparity one to one so uh so it was good fam is definitely doing a lot of good things uh yeah. I, I hopefully I get to work with them some in the future. Uh, but my thing is, Allison, I really want to reform the individual. The system is going to be the system. If we work on the individual, work on the person to avoid the system, then they should be fine. So uh, we would, I'm about reforming individuals, not the system. Because the system is it's going to do what it does. Man. So um, speaking of reforming the person and helping, you know, not either them going back or not getting there in the first place, what would you say could help people when they're coming? What, if you could speak to the masses of, I'm sorry, I'm not getting this out. If you could speak to the masses, how would you encourage them to come alongside people re-entering society and how can they feel supported? How can you feel supported? What would help your um, experience right now as you're newly in this situation? And the uh, main thing a person needs coming home from a uh, prison sentence is a good support system. You know, because I could, it, it's so many times uh, I had trouble getting my driver's license. I went there, I needed this paperwork. I, I, when I said I didn't have this. And if, if a person is not strong willed or just determined, make it easy to say, forget it, I'm going to drive without any license. Or I'm just going to just, you know, it's so easy. So a support system is really, really, really important for people returning citizens, when people are just getting out, uh, having somewhere to stay, maybe having just a, little, a little family support, a little clothing, you know, just. It's really important because trust me, nobody's gonna go hungry. One thing about it, if you're hungry, if you need somewhere to stay, you're gonna get you somewhere to stay. Let's just be real. Yeah. You know, self-preservation. Yeah. So, but if like I me, mean, I had I had a great family support. I had, you know, just overwhelming family support. And everybody didn't have it like I have. 
So I'm actually looking into starting a nonprofit for returning citizens, for people. You know, um, I want I don't know how that works because the nonprofit you have to go through the government. I don't really want to mess with the government, but uh right. I want to do something, I want to do something to help people returning, uh, because uh it, it, it's it's definitely needed. It's definitely needed. How, do you think it's very, this is just this coming to me right now. I love that you want to stay involved because you've learned a lot and, you know, it wasn't by an accident that you experienced all that and you want to use it moving forward. Do you think a lot of people that are reentering either want to just get as much distance as they can from the prison experience and all of that? Or do you think a lot of people do want to stay involved after learning what you've learned and experiencing those things? Most people want to get away from it, Alice. That's one thing I see. Most people are like, they don't want to know that I've been in prison. they like ashamed of it. But, you know, it's part of my story. It's, it's, it's part of my life, you know, and I can't, I can't really run from what I've been through. And you won't have a testimony without a test. So if you want to tell about the great things that God has done for you, you got to include it. But, you know, to each his own. I'm built for it. I'm better for it. Uh, I was kind of popular as the drug dealer, I was kind of popular as a person in the street. So now that I'm back, you know, people are still living off the old, you know, people, they, they, they call me Ken Fulton. They don't say Kendrick. So, and it's weird. They say my whole name. It's like Ken Fulton. I'm like my name is Ken. So they know the old Ken Fulton. So I want them to know the new person, the new redeemed person. That's why it's Kendrick now. That's why. So, and I get so much love when people, they respond like, man, I like what you're doing. So. It's not for everybody. Some people want to run from it, but I'm gonna embrace it yeah. because I know, you know, if truth be told, we all got some, we all got some issues. Let's just be real. Yep. You know, let's be, we all got some. Yep. We got, we all got some. So, yeah. you know, so. Well, I always love talking to you. And before we go and on this platform, because this won't be the last time I talk to you, but if you could, you do, you do a lot of interviews and I always wonder, is there something you don't always, you don't get to say, or you forget to say, or you wish you could just have an open forum just to like get it out. So use the last minute or two and tell the viewers, whether it's families that have people that are incarcerated or it's people that are learning the, the this arena, like I am, um, this is your moment. Like, what would you like people to know that maybe they don't know? I was just like, if, if you have a loved one who's uh, in the federal prison system or any in any uh, criminal justice system, just be encouraged. You know, they're going to make it. I know I know that they're probably racking their brain. They're wondering what's going to happen and how we're going to get there. You will get through it. I'm, I'm proof. You, you're looking at living proof that you will make it. Now, it was 17 years for me. Now, some sentence, everybody's sentence is not as long as mine. Everybody's sentence is not excessive. Some is five years. Don't panic. You can only do one day at a time. Just be encouraged. I would hope and pray that you would just trust God to help you make it through the same way he helped me. He will help you learn from this experience, get better from this experience, and just try to help others. So that's what I, I really just try to impart that on people is that, hey, it, it's, it, it could definitely work for your good. I'm living proof. Yeah, you are such a good example, and you're so encouraging, and it's why we wanted to have you on this platform because – I think perspective can shift anybody's story. Perspective can give anybody hope to keep moving forward, no matter what choices they've made, no matter what kind of trouble they've gotten into. And your perspective, I mean, you are full of joy. I encourage everybody to follow Life in the Feds on TikTok. Tell all your platforms. Let's do that real quick. Tell all your platforms. Tell where we can get more of your awesome Life in the Feds swag and all the things. Life in the Feds on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, Life in the Feds. I'm on Facebook at Kendrick Fulton Sr. And you can get the Life in the Feds swag at lifeinthefeds.shop. That was not the first time you've ever done that. You That just rolled off your tongue. <laughs> no, I just know. I know all the platforms. See, Life in the Feds is easy. Life in the Feds is everywhere. So that's it. That's on, that covers three. So only thing, that, but I, I got Life in the Feds merchandise on Facebook, but I'm, I'm learning how to do that little page. I don't know how to is work that, that where yet, people so. are Is that where people are reaching out to you to get their merch is on Facebook? Yeah, people, yeah, people everywhere. They, they, they DM me on Instagram. They DM me on TikTok. They DM me on Facebook. The website, the website does what it does, but I guess most people just like the personal and like, I guess, I don't know. So and I gotta, get, I gotta get you a photo with me and my shirt because you put it out there. So I gotta send you one. You got it. 
You got it. And send me a song so I can put it on my story. Yeah, oh, that's definitely. Right. You ask for a song. What do you write on there? A song that inspires you or that you like? Because you're new. Because you're new to the new the new music right now. Since when? Yeah, you yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't know the music. Don't let me pick the song. I'm gonna have you with some in 2000. So you give me your song that way. I'll have you. you know, I'm, I'm gonna pick you a song from 2000 or actually okay. from mid 80s. That's when I'll pick you a song. Hey, listen. Well, it's your song. Everybody know. I didn't pick it. It's your song. They can kind of tell the songs I pick because they know I'm, you know, I'm old school. So. Yeah, <laughs> I loved having you on. I'm so bummed Christy couldn't get her thing figured out. So she's watching and she loves you too. And you're awesome. So we will be in touch and we'll do this more. We'll do it again. Yeah. Tell Christy we'll, we'll, we'll make up. We'll, we'll do something. You know, hopefully things take off. I have y'all on my show. I have y'all on. That, hey, look, these these two fine ladies put me on their show. I'm just repaying the back. So y'all awesome. come back on my platform. So awesome. I'm trying to get some I'm trying to get some podcast stuff. I got people who say, hey, you need to get a podcast. I'm like, listen, I'm only one person. I can't sell t-shirts, do a podcast, go to work. They want coffee mugs, they want hand sanitizer, they want mouse pads. I'm like, listen, hold up. You need some I'm, I'm barely, Yeah, I'm barely selling t-shirts. So, you know. You, you spread the limit for you. It's obvious. It's clear that you are going places. You are infectious. People love talking to you. So I can't wait to watch what you do. And I'm so glad you're my buddy. And I've got you on my speed dial and all the good things. So go enjoy your family. You know you still have a house full. Thank you, Allison. Okay. Talk to you soon. Bye, Kendra. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.